us and let him tell us some stories. So, Tom Paxton. And as I said, since Nora provides such an, an amazing introduction to these recordings, uh, we're going to let her speak to you for a while through this video. So. The photo now are, uh, these are the original releases of what came out uh, from the concerts. Uh, one thing that was very strange that we noticed was that the concerts were a combo of both the Hollywood Bowl and the Carnegie Hall shows. And so sometimes listening to the record, the, the original vinyl was a little disconcerting because you'd be going from inside Carnegie Hall and then all of a sudden you'd be outside at the Hollywood Bowl. And, I'm not really sure why they wanted to present it that way. Maybe it was a way to give everyone a chance to be, you know, on one of the records. But we felt it was really important to present the concerts as they originally happened. Mm -hmm. So we went back to try to source through um, all the materials that we could find uh, for each particular concert, and then be able to give give them to you in, in their totality. So. Uh, I just I thought it would be really important to sort of explain the reasons for the show, yes? So, you know, Woody had Huntington's, and a number of Woody's children from his earlier marriage, marriages, excuse me, had Huntington's as well. So, um, after Woody passed, um, uh, Marjorie, who was Woody's wife, was very concerned about what would happen to, to Nora and, and Arlo and Jody if one of them got hunted. So the original idea was to be able to generate funds for the kids in case uh, you know that happened to them. So I thought it would be good to go back and look a little bit about uh, their, their family life. So here's a really early photo of um, Woody and Marjorie. <clears throat> At this point Woody was in the Almanac Singers and Marjorie was a dancer in the Martha, da Martha Graham Dance Company. Um, here's some uh, photos of the family. There's Arlo in the front, Nora's on her mom's lap. Um, and these are the Beach Haven Apartments in Queens, yes? <laughs> and uh, the, the apartment complex behind uh, the family on the right is a Trump building. And um, and, uh, Senior. you know, uh, the apple from the tree thing, yes? <laughs> yep. And um, Woody had a, a lot of problems with Fred Trump, and he wrote a number of, of songs, both published and unpublished, about Fred. I just want to read you a little bit, because I think it, it's, it's really great. Um, here's an excerpt from Old Man Trump. Beach Haven ain't my home. No, I just can't pay this rent. My money's down the drain and my soul is badly bent. Beach Haven is Trump's tower, where no black folks come to roam. No, no, old man Trump, old Beach Haven ain't my home. And I, I think uh, one of the things that was pretty revelatory about doing this whole project was learning and rediscovering that, you know, Woody is always relevant. And, and the things that he cared about Crazily enough, it's 70 years later, we're still, we're still literally dealing with that. We're still dealing with his landlord's kid. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of dovetail off of, off of Steve mentioning the lyrics. Um, there, there are at least three lyrics, that, three songs that Woody wrote about Beach Haven and Fred Trump. But there's also a single space type document that we have on display, along with the lyrics at the center. Um, and it's a very thoughtful essay that Woody's writing about you know, Beach Haven, as pretty as you are on the outside, you're ugly on the inside because you're separating people based on their culture, their religion, and their race. And it's just, as most things that Woody writes in prose and in his lyrics, um, it's very deep and they're very thoughtful uh, in the way that he's laying out the issues. It's, it's not confrontational, it's, it's very thoughtful and um, academic in the way that he's approaching this issue. And the last paragraph is just, 
It's, it is the solution to the problem. So he lays out the problem, he discusses it, and then he, the last paragraph, he's, he provides a solution, which is that you and me get together and walk together and talk together and play together and sing together and hull together and lift together and dance together and march together until we lick this goddamn Dracy hate together. What do you say, huh? And that's Woody. Here's the problem. Now, let's get together and figure out where we can meet and discuss and have common ground and solve the issues. And if that's not relevant today, I don't know what is. That's, that's where we're missing the mark, is understanding that we can come to a compromise about things and make the world better for everyone. And now back to Steve. Sorry about that. No, no, that's, that's wonderful. No, really important. Um, OK, let me go on. So. Um, here are, are uh, uh, some photos of Woody at uh, Greystone. Uh, both of these photos are from 1957. Uh, this is his family visiting Woody at Greystone. Um, uh, on the right, you could see Arlo and Midland Lampel, who was the uh, uh, arranger and, and, and wrote the scripts for the two concerts that we're talking about. Cisco Houston, Lee Hayes, and Sonny Terry. Um, here's an amazing picture of Jack Elliott visiting Woody. Um, this is the hospital where uh, Bob Dylan went to visit Woody um, for the first time. Um, here's uh, a copy of the handwritten lyrics for a song to Woody, which was on the, the first Bob Dylan record, and then um, also, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, underneath his picture, there are, he wrote the uh, handwritten directions to how to get to the hospital, and it was on the back of a Folk City uh, ticket, which was $2 for that night show. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Um, and so here are some handwritten lyrics about how to go to Brooklyn State so that you could see Woody, because a lot of uh, singer-songwriters would go out and visit Woody um, in the hospital. Um, here's a, a picture of Marjorie around the time of the concerts um, uh, after Woody had passed. Um, so here's the, the start of the Carnegie Hall um, concert. So uh, originally there was supposed to have been uh, one show at night and then a rehearsal show in the afternoon. Um, uh, the way that we understood it was that, that so many people wanted to come that they decided to open up the afternoon show. Um, and so the afternoon show became uh, a publicly available show. Uh, all the collectors have been yammering at me about why haven't we been able to find a concert recording from the afternoon show. And, and the reason was is because that was the rehearsal and they didn't want it to be recorded. So um, uh, I, we, we tried to find all of the assets that we could, but that does not exist. So you can see here that the proceeds from the concert, we're gonna go to the newly organized committee to combat, combat Huntington's, but also you can see at the top of the poster it says the Guthrie Children's Trust Fund which was sort of what I was talking about earlier, about how the money was going to help the kids if, God forbid, someone got ill. Um, uh, here are some uh, kids outside of Carnegie Hall looking for tickets, and you can see the tickets were $3.50. Uh, I went to Harold Leventhal's family. They were really sweet. They let me go kind of rummaging through his archive which I like to do. And uh, I found these, these tickets. He had these really uh, uh, mint tickets. And it's uh, incredible to think that you could see all of these amazing people for $3.50. Oh. I think that would get you, what, a Coca-Cola now? Maybe? <laughs> yeah. um, Not a Carnegie Hall, it wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, Here's a, a photo of the nighttime show uh, of all the people in Carnegie Hall, January 20th, 68. Uh, I don't know if you can see the writing but or the figures, but there's Allen Ginsberg up at the top. 
There's a photo of Nora with her mother and her grandmother. I'm excuse me, Nora, her grandmother and her great grandmother. Uh, and then there's two of the weavers in the audience as well. Um, here's some backstage <laughs> photos, and there's a photo of Tom backstage. Um, Mike Bloomfield and Dylan and Pete. Uh, do you want to jump in a little bit about the backstage? Serious party because Woody was there, but but we couldn't help but feel celebratory as well. That's amazing. Do you, uh, do, you, do you want to share that story you told me about Bob yesterday? Oh, yeah. Halfway from the apron to the rear of the stage were a series of uh, portable risers about eight feet high that uh, blocked off the back of the stage as we didn't need and uh, then compacted everything in front of it. So bef when the show was, uh, the house lights were still up but we all filed out onto the stage behind these risers ready to come on stage and we could feel the house. And I mean, the atmosphere was utterly electric. I mean, this was farewell to Woody and it was the first time Dylan would have been seen in a year since his motorcycle accident. And what we did, we had uh, what they call hootenanny presentation, which is a semicircle of seats, and we all came on stage together and remained on stage together and just took our turns at the microphones. And so as it happened, I was standing just in front of, of Bob, and he was very nervous. Uh, and I said, Bob, I, you know, I, just, I want to prepare you uh, for something. Uh, you know, you, you can feel the house. This is what, you know, when, when we come out, and they see me, they're going to go crazy. And, and, yeah. Don't let it, you know, and, and anyway. And he had the good grace to laugh. Yeah. That's an awesome story. <laughs> How many people does Carnegie hold? I'm sorry? How many people in Carnegie? Uh, 2,800 maybe? Something like 2,800, 3,000. Something sure. like that. Um, so here are some fun backstage photos. Um, this is the, uh, the run of the show script. I know it's really hard for you to see it here. Um, but um, you can see that the, the show was produced by Harold Leventhal. Uh, it was adapted and staged by Mildred Lampell, who was with Woody and the Almanac Singers. Um, and you can also see that Sonny and Terry were supposed to come, but for some reason they didn't come. Um, so this, uh, when, once you looked at the run of the show, you could sort of, we sort of started to get a sense of the things we were missing. Um, and that sort of began what I like to call the treasure hunt, which is basically we have to start rummaging through, going to record companies, trying to go to collectors, trying to find as much, you know, we went to Mitch Blank to try to see what he had, try uh, to find all the assets that we could. So, um, there was an incomplete set of tapes at the Guthrie Archive in New York City. Um, as I said before, I went to the Leventhal's family and they were really great and they let me rummage around. Um, uh, so when we, we contacted the record companies about it, about uh, six or eight months into the project, we got an email from someone at Warner Brothers saying, Oh, we found these tapes and they say they have Woody Guthrie written on them. Do you think you might want to see them? <laughs> <laughs> so Nora was right, of course, right on it. She said, yes, of course we'd like to see them. And so they took some photos of it and those turned out to be the original 16 track two inches from the Hollywood Bowl shows. Those had been totally gone for 60 years and I was able to uh, you know, bake them and digitize them, and all the, the music from the Hollywood Bowl uh, CDs are all new mixes from the original masters. Um, Steve, was that all on an unedited tape, or was that, the, was that just the edit, or was that the raw show? That was the raw show. The Hollywood Bowl show was the raw show, um, completely unedited. So, uh, the Hollywood Bowl show uh, is everything that there was that night. The Carnegie Hall show, some of it, a couple of songs we were never able to find 
from the, from the nighttime show. Uh, Harold had some tapes, the record company had some tapes, but as you just pointed out, those were already edited from the masters. So that's what we had to work with through the Carnegie Hall stuff. Also, interestingly enough, the Carnegie Hall thing is seven and a half mono, yes? So it was really challenging to try to, to, to get the speed correct, and I don't want to get too obsessive about it, but we worked really hard on getting all of that stuff as good as we could. Excuse me, can you briefly explain what thinking is and why it was necessary? Right, so most of the uh, tapes that were made in the mid-70s, early 70s on, are made on Ampex 456, or sometimes 406, and uh, this is going to be geeky, but here's the way it works. So, the tape has two sides to it. Yeah, there's a black side and there's a brown side. So the brown side is the, the magnet, where the magnetic particles get charged, yes? The black side is the, is the backing that holds that together. Now, over time, what happens is the two of them disassociate from each other. And that's when you get shedding. Like all of us have uh, mm -hmm. played, there's probably a lot of engineers in the room here now, we've played an old tape and it starts to shed, yes? So that's because the two parts are dissociated from each other. So when, if you bake them, you are basically reheating the glue that, that, that uh, binds the two of them together. So the good news is that the tape format is a really resilient format. You know, uh, unlike hard drives, which literally just stop. You know, I, I've been able to bake tapes that were flooded. I'm working on a Blondie project right now, and uh, Chris Stein's barn completely got flooded, flooded in Woodstock. I was able to take the stuff out, we dried them out, we put the masks on, we put them in the oven, and you can play it. So that's basically the explanation about baking. <laughs> so we had to bake these woody tapes because they were in the, in the vault for you know, many years. Um, okay, uh, so here's uh, some wonderful stage photos from that night. Um, and um, here's a beautiful shot of um, uh, uh, Bob Dylan, Judy Collins, and Arlo, and here's uh, some uh, Judy singing. The crops are rotting and the peaches are rotting. The oranges are piled in their creosote dumps. Mm. You're flying back to the Mexican border. It takes all their money to wait back again. Goodbye to my one goodbye, Rosalita. Adios, mis amigos, Jesus y Maria.
For all they will call you will be deported. The sky plane caught fire over Los Gatos Canyon. A fireball of lightning and shook all our hills. For all these dear friends are scattered like dry leaves. The radio says they are just deported. Is this the best way we can raise our good orchards? Is this the best way we can grow our good crops? To die and be scattered, to rot on the topsoil, to be called by no name except deportee. super poignant it's you know <laughs> what she's singing about we're, we're dealing with every day now um here's a picture <laughs> uh, <laughs> illuminating the <laughs> gentleman right next oh, to me yeah. no change at all you can <laughs> see <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. no more <laughs> um, and one of the unreleased uh, tracks that we found was uh, was from Tom and so I get to play that for you. Get together up, eight people. Story I would tell about Bertie Boy Floyd, the outlaw. So um, I don't 
I want to put you on the spot, but sorry, I'm going to. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit maybe about Woody and why yeah, you uh, like to sing Woody. I was uh, managed at about that time by Harold Leventhal, yeah. and I used to go up to his office just to hang out and just to visit with Harold. He was a, a great uh, rack on tour, and he would... Um, he was not a tall man, or a thin one. <laughs> or, or a hairy one, yeah. He, he loved his cigars, and he would get up and walk, he would pace around his office with a cigar. It would, I called him the best stand-up comic in, in New York. He would have me in hysterics. And uh, he loved to tell me things that I didn't know. He said, I'll tell you something about Woody that you didn't know. I said, what is that? He said, Woody never had a card. The party never gave him a card. And I said, get out of here. He said, no. They, would, they couldn't rely on him. <laughs> he said, uh, they'd tell him to be someplace, and, and he'd go to California instead. <laughs> he, was, so he was never a card-carrying <laughs> member of the party. He wrote a column in the Daily Worker, Woody Says, but no card, no member, no member. They couldn't, they couldn't rely on it. <laughs> and, and, and Harold told me about when the Weavers played Carnegie Hall in 56, which was led to the, one of the greatest recordings uh, any of us have ever heard in the folk music revival. Uh, and the, the men, all three men, refused to wear tuxedos. This was 1956 and Harold got indignant. He said, this is Carnegie Hall. And it was. I mean, Carnegie Hall was Carnegie Hall. And, but they wouldn't wear tuxedos. And they went back and forth, back and forth. And finally, Harold won the day by showing them a photograph of Paul Robeson doing a concert in Moscow wearing white tie and tails. So they gave up. They wore tuxedos. <laughs> but Pete wore red socks. <laughs> Um, and I, I wanted to make sure and mention, and I know that um, in the details about the release, it, it makes mention of, of the, the books that are included. Um, a lot of these uh, photos and the scans of the documents are part of the accompanying book that goes with this box set. And it is it is an amazing written work to complement yeah. to complement this incredible audio work. Um, so you get you you get in, you're able to be enlightened on several different dimensions uh, through reading about the background of what was going on, having these photos to pull you into this backstage environment and on stage environment and just read read some of the background about what was going on and and those who were participating um which, yeah, it's an amazing thing yeah it, it gives it a whole different dynamic mm -hmm. because you're able to do a deep dive into what these concerts were really about and how meaningful they were. five years I mean, <laughs> uh, it, it nora you know sets sets it in motion and then we just go at it like good mm. dogs until we, you know, uh, Michael Clef, our husband, is really an amazing guy. And, and him and I went at the audio and just kept going at it and going at mm. it and trying it again and trying different ways to get it to be as good as we could. So I think probably three, four, five years, sorry. Mm. There's probably no more specific. Mm. You might want to mention there's actually two books yes, two in the set, which I don't think you mentioned. This. I, I think I said books and then... Did you? I'm sorry, okay. Yeah. One is that program or whatever the uh, special thing they uh, say. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's Saturday. I've been in a conference yeah. since yeah. Tuesday. That's okay. <laughs> Just a beautiful thing. I'm fairly thing. coherent right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yes, definitely. We'll be the judge. Too, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> 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 but uh, it is the the <coughs> entire um, release is just an amazing uh, combination. Um, and as, as somebody who appreciates the written word as well as the audio um, and, and being able to, to understand a little bit more in detail from those who were participating and those who were there, 
those who were um, part of this event and, and having uh, their experiences as well as the audio is, is really a nice thing. It, it puts you in the moment. Did you find any unpublished photos from the, uh, from the photographer? Yes, the there are tons of, Michael found tons of unpublished photos. Okay. Um, he did a real serious photo hunt, mm -hmm. and in the book there, there are tons of them, yes. A lot of, uh, a lot of the unpublished were from backstage during rehearsals, is that oh, right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm going to buzz on here, we've got a lot to go. Um, yeah. Here's a, a, an amazing photo of uh, Bob Dylan and, and Rick Danko and Robbie before they were the band, yes. And uh, as Tom said before, this was his first show after the motorcycle accident. And, uh, um, and he, he did something a little differently uh, than everyone else, which he, he did like a mini set. Yeah. Right? So he did his three songs in sort of as, as a mini set um, uh, with what was then, you know, the band, but not yet the band. So those many ways. stuff at me. Um, here are some uh, uh, photos from the, uh, from the Carnegie Hall show. Uh, uh, Robert Ryan and there's uh, Bob Dylan and Judy and Arlo. And then next to that is uh, Mary Jo, who is Woody's sister. And then uh, next to her is Gwen, who was Woody's first child. And then Marjorie. Um, uh, this is a photo that I wanted to show because you can actually see the guys in the band uh, pretty clearly. You can see Garth, uh, Rick Danko, there's a really good picture of Levon and Robbie uh, all having fun watching Jack. Um, some more uh, photos from, from the show. Okay, so... Uh, uh, that's about the Carnegie Hall show. Are there any questions about the Carnegie Hall show? Yes, sir. It's not a question, but um, if, if this was in 68, the band had already been the band for a couple of years. But they weren't named the band yet. Yeah. But I thought in 66, uh, Big Pink was the band. I think that's, isn't that the record later? Yeah. I think the record's later. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Too old yes, sir. <laughs> One of the backstage shots showed Mike Bloomfield. Did he ever get on stage? Um, I, do, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's a really great question, and we couldn't find any proof of him playing. Mm. But we were really delighted to clearly find these shots of him backstage. Steve, do we know why 
why the one original LP was on Columbia and the other one was on Warner Brothers. Why did Columbia have both of those record art? Uh, well, uh, Nora likes to say it's uh, Macy's and Gimbel's. <laughs> like they, uh, they all wanted to sort of be part of it and, and wanted to sort of help in, in the effort. And so they were willing to share the artists who were on the various labels and also share, you know, the releases. So that's, that's kind of what Nora thinks about. Just uh, a little tidbit, um, not known, but Harold uh, said to me, he said, there are no press passes. Mm. They want to come, they buy a ticket. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yep. and Columbia did not have the, had a, even the, the, or did they have the Masters but didn't have the raw tapes? Columbia did not. Oh, God, no. They barely even had the, the put together Masters because they went to Hollywood. This was a really strange part of the, of the, the tape journey. Is that all? Uh, they were were not really worked on here in New York. They went to Hollywood and they were worked on in California to even do the Columbia Records release. And so they did not have in their in their library. And we went at them a whole bunch of times to try to get them to, to look. And I, I, you know, they really did look, but they didn't have those. Um, so uh, here's an interesting thing to think about: what happened between the two shows? between January 20th and September 18th, 1970. There's a list of events that happened. Um, and you can, Sean Lentz wrote a really amazing essay inside the box set. Uh, and and he, he speaks to these events, but here they are. Martin Luther King assassination, Robert Kennedy assassination, the riots in Chicago, the election of Tricky Dicky, <laughs> Kent State, the moon landing, uh, the release of Easy Rider and and uh, then Woodstock. <laughs> Just a few things. <laughs> yeah. So and, and and notice it's like uh, the difference between a black and white world and and now we're in a color world, right? Uh, I don't know if that's because of all the acid. I'm not really sure. But, uh, <laughs> but you'll see from from the Hollywood Bowl thing, there's lots of color acids. Uh, here is the poster. For the for the Hollywood Bowl show, um, yeah. some some people reappear and some new people appear. Once again, it's for the committee to um, combat Huntington's, which was more of a an organization at this point. Uh, there's a picture of Harold, um, and the Hollywood Bowl ticket was seven. more expensive. It was seven dollars and fifty cents. Whoa. Whoa. So. Uh, <laughs> um, and a, a nice poster from the Huntington's people about uh, the proceeds going to the genetic research. Joe Hill. Um, so this was, I talked about this before when I went to the Falls. This I found Pete's diary, and this was from Pete's diary, so they let me take a photo of it, which I thought was really cool. I'm talking about flying to the rehearsals and then the show at the Hollywood Bowl, and then he skedaddled out of there right away. He wasn't staying around, he left the next day. Tom, were you, ever, were you asked to go to California at all? No. That? You were not? No. Okay. Um, so here are some rehearsal photos from the Continental Hyatt House or the Continental Riot House, depending on <laughs> what weed you were smoking at the time. Um, uh, these, a lot of these photos are, you know, uh, have never been seen before. Um, Joan Baez, Country Joe, Jack Earl Robinson, and Odetta. Uh, Pete has a beard now. That's a, maybe post Woodstock. Uh, Odetta and Arlo. Um, that's an amazing photo yeah. of Pete and Joan Baez. Right. Am I going too fast? No, no. Okay. Um, here is the, the run of the show, again, for the Hollywood Bowl, so that we knew this was the Millard Lampel script, so we knew, you know, what songs were when and who <laughs> sang them. So when we were able to present the show, uh, this time we were able to put it in its correct order. Um, here are some of the assets that we did find. Um, that this Harold, these, these are tapes that Harold had. Uh, uh, um, um, you can see his name on it. Some of these say safeties. These are quarter-inch reels. 
Um, here's part of Miller Lampel's script. Um, uh, and also a backstage <laughs> photo of them going through the script talking about um, uh, um, what's going to happen on stage. So, this has never been seen before. This is uh, footage from the rehearsals backstage. Two verses by himself. Otto will come in on the third. For the picture. And after Otto plays with the harp on the first, that's when you get it. After there's been a harp verse. Well, it's after the harp verse. The same. The same. The same. The same. The right words. No, well, I wrote you. Yeah, Otto, yeah, well, we thought that uh, what's going to happen is tomorrow I'm going to wake up and find we've got 19 hour shows. So I can't take it. You can't take it. Uh, That's the same. There's going to be no ego. There's going to be no ego. There's going to be nobody who's going to say it's all going to be grooving on singing with everybody else. Same one. This is a good one. <laughs> well. Okay, here's a chord pattern. Wow. Let's hold out the band. Let him play the first verse himself. Let's come in come on the second verse. And uh, two verses by himself. I will come in on the third. Our deputy sheriff. And after Otto plays with a harp on one verse, that's when you come in. So it'll be the fourth. Wow. After there's been a harp verse. Yeah. Well, it's after the harp verse finishes. This ain't this ain't the right words. And I need time. Yeah, Otto. Well, we thought that uh, what's going to happen is tomorrow I'm going to wake up and find we got 19 hour shows. So I can't take verses. Uh, can't take verses. Uh, cut the song. Okay. Uh, Let's go. Okay. Editorial. Okay. Yeah, this is, you notice the same way you say you copied it from the last Yeah, right. Yeah, right. All right. You're right. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, my God. Yeah. My poor hands are so My poor feet have traveled a hot, dusty road. Out of your dust bowl and westward we rode. Your desert was hot and your mountain was cold. She's about seventeen. You get She'd be 25. Show, but Where did you find, you find the that? Uh, that's from Nora's personal archive. Wow. It was sort of the best way to describe that. Wow. I think I'd have to describe it that way, otherwise she'll hit me. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, here are some photos from outside. Uh, um, Millard Lampel and, and, and Joan Baez. Here's Richie. Um, how much time do we have left? Oh, God. 14 days. Okay. Wow. Okay, so I, I think I can just sort of speed through. Um, uh, Was Bob not asked to come to California, Steve? Do you know I, or? I don't know. Okay. Um, you can get an idea of the size of the Hollywood Bowl here. Um, um, there's Country Joe writing the music to Woman at Home. This was only the second time someone actually added music to Woody Lyric. Um, uh, this is Arlo looking at the original um, uh, artwork that Woody did, that they blew up. And Nora wanted me to tell you that the, uh, the pillars in the corner 
are from the architect Frank Gehry. <laughs> um, so uh, here's a, a, a little bit of Richie. Um, this was um, uh, an unreleased uh, Richie track. mention who Earl Robinson is. I heard somebody else ask that. I think people don't know that. Yes, and uh, he, he's in this photo here on the left. There's Earl yeah. on the left next to Odetta. Um, Jack. Um, and there's uh, Peter Fonda who uh, Nora was talking about in the video. Um, and the last thing I wanted to do was um, to play you uh, something um, that no one's ever seen before, and uh, again, it's from Nora's personal archive, and it, it's a video of uh, one of the songs at the Hollywood Bowl um, show. Wow! So just give me a second. I gotta get out of this. Thank you. We just restored this just for today. Hopefully, we'll be happy.
Pete stole that hat from me, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That footage is not included in the box? No, no. there's no video on no the box. No one's ever seen that before. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, if there are any questions for any of us? Yes. In terms of uh, looking at the two scripts, are they 100%, 50%, or how closely do they correlate to each other and related the tracks, same songs from both, but maybe different performers? Yeah, just that... different songs, different writing, yeah. you know, different uh, yeah. narration uh, for the two narrators, because uh, they spoke about different parts of Woody's life. So sometimes they're the same, sometimes not, but they're not exactly the same. And uh, his children in Huntington's, what's the history of that? Was, were well, some afflicted? You know? um, two from his first marriage uh, had Huntington's. Um, none of the children with uh, Marjorie had Huntington's. Of course, Kathy uh, was killed in a, an apartment fire when she was four. So, but as far as Nora, Arlo, or Jody, not. Um, and then um, his last child with his wife, as he was exhibiting the signs of, of Huntington's, did, did have the disease. So it's, it's interesting, and Norris, Norris said before that the um, neurological specialists say that there is no combination of genetics between the mother and father that would make the children more inclined to develop the disease, but it's interesting that, that none of the children with Marjorie did have it. Thank you. Yes, Steve, uh, two questions. One for you, I guess, which is rights issues uh, in putting this together. I'm going to ask two questions. And the second one is uh, Tom, maybe Tom can comment on, but there's some wonderful interviews that were done afterwards. And there's the Phil Oaks interview about not being invited. Maybe Tom could comment if he knows anything about that. About what? Wasn't, what there's a track on there where Phil talks yeah, about, end, where he talks about not being invited and left out. Yeah. Yeah, an I don't know if you heard that uh, set. Yeah, okay. yes, and he was kind of upset that he hadn't. hadn't I don't blame him. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I agree. That's yeah, but the the rights issues for reissuing this stuff. The rights issues. I mean, it's the miracle of Nora, really. It's because people, you know, love yeah. Woody and love so, Nora, and and that's how you get the rights to do things like this from everybody. The record companies work these days. Yeah. They say no all the time to everything. Right. No is usually yeah. their answer. But they don't say no to Nora. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so that's how this box set exists. Yeah. Literally. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Yes, sir. Tom, uh, would you comment on your proximity to Okima as a kid? Proximity to? Okima. Oh, yeah. My town, Bristow. It was about uh, 26 miles north of Okima, almost due north of Okima. We used, I, I was on high school football teams that played against teams from Okima, um, to my cost. Um, <laughs> um, when I was uh, in high school, I graduated high school 55, um, I didn't know Woody at all, but of course we all knew um, uh, so long it's been good to know you yeah, because it had been a, a hit and and um, uh, by by uh, the by the weavers yeah, yeah. so we knew that song but we I, I didn't until I got down to the university and started learning folk songs and checking out records from the library mm -hmm. that's when I first uh, encountered Woody and I was amazed to find out that he was from Okima um, uh, my proximity um, to Dylan, on, well, I, I was about as close as I am to Steve uh, when he was singing his mini set. He was right next to me, and I had a front row seat for some of the best music of, of that whole evening. Did you get three songs that night, too, Tom? Did you get to sing three songs that night? I think I did. Um, I think I, I, well, we heard me singing Pretty Boy Floyd. I also sang. Um, pastures of Plenty. Our Pastures of Plenty. Brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, 
And the group songs you were on. But the, I think I sang another solo, but I can't remember what it was. Made it a historical bone, perhaps? I, I, I do not remember. Hmm. Yes, sir. Um, two things. First of all, Pete had a beard because he'd been sailing on the clear water. They didn't have hot water to shave. He started to grow the beard back then. But I was curious to know, how did the performers and the songs get matched up? Who made that decision? Did you volunteer to do certain songs? I think, um, I think Millard had a lot to, yeah. to say about who sang what. Um, I, I know that um, I had no voice at all in what I sang and didn't need one. So you were basically a signed song? Hmm? Basically you were assigned which song? Yeah, we were assigned our songs. Okay, because there was an earlier script, that, there was an earlier tribute to Millard's script with totally different songs, mm. totally different performers back in the 50s. Well, I'll just say that I was assigned my songs. I don't know how it was with the other artists. Uh, uh, I, I expected if Bob expressed the, uh, a desire to sing one song or another, that's the song I would sing. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have any additional info about that. Any other questions? Well, thank you all really for wow. coming. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Pleasure to tell this story.